problem? Yep. All right. Thanks, Daniel, for having me, everyone at the Active Inference Lab. Uh, sorry for canceling twice. Uh, life's been kind of crazy with uh, finishing uh, this book that this talk will be about and having a kid. I'm six months old and I, I got sick like a week ago, like right leading up to uh, like, you know, didn't want to cancel a third time and look crazy. So this is a very rushed presentation. Um, it'll be better if it's more of like a conversation since I haven't even gone through the slides myself once. Um, and it's going to get into a lot of things like immediately like open up bags of worms. Like there's just philosophical issues, um, things that people won't agree about like immediately. But um, yeah, so this is just going to be like a small introduction to the thesis in the book. Um, and yeah, I'll explain more, I guess, uh, after I begin. So yeah, it's uh, call this the integrated evolutionary synthesis um, compared to like the modern synthesis or even the extended evolutionary synthesis. This is the integrated because it uh, kind of reconceptualizes evolution, uh, biology and evolution in terms of the, in terms of thermodynamics and information theory or energy flows energy and information flows um, takes from cybernetics. Uh, so yeah, it's a non-reductive theory of everything uh, that includes emergent phenomena like life, mind, and civilization. Um, I say that because most theories of everything we're used to are fundamental physics theories that don't have anything to say about life and consciousness. They ignore them. Um, and uh, I don't think those should be called theories of everything because theories of everything should be uh, an explanation for everything. And if you leave the things that we care about most out, then it's not much of a theory of everything. So this is the book I've spent the last two to three years writing obsessively. And uh, it's available for pre-order now. So if you want to check that out, um, you can find it with a Google search. Uh, here's the table of contents. Um, so the book is broken into three sections. Uh, part one uh, talks about the origins of life and part two about evolution, while part three focuses on uh, consciousness and free will and the fate of life in the universe. So these like really big questions, but we're going to focus on part two and uh, give a pretty like a superficial overview of part two, um, but you can feel free to ask me uh, any questions about uh, any of the other topics that are related. And I'll try to see what I can answer without going into like all of the information that I would, I would need to explain those things. Um, so Thomas Huxley, known as uh, Darwin's bulldog, uh, because he was such a strong advocate for Darwin's theory, said that the question of questions for mankind, the problem which underlies all others is more deeply interesting than any other, is the ascertainment and of the place which man occupies in nature and of his relations to the universe of things. So where do we fit into the grand cosmic scheme? Um, most scientists in the 20th century, and I would even say now, um, believe uh that we are an accident so uh jacques Monod, uh french um biochemist who won the nobel prize for uh physiology and medicine um wrote a book called chance and necessity which was really influential and he was just as reductionist as you can get man at last knows that he is alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe out of which he emerged only by chance neither so some of the words are covered by uh by daniel so neither is his destiny spelled out nor his duty have been written down i think there's something wrong with that quote but um so if there are times where i'm trying to read something where the picture's over i might have to skip you can move the you can move that because it looks oh. different on my side it it, it looks fine Perfect. thank you great yeah um neither his destiny nor his duty have been written down so that was kind of based on this old idea that uh, the emergence of life uh, was a product of chance assembly. So like this uh, just uh, statistical fluctuation that brought together all the molecules needed to create the first cell. 
uh, we now know that that's probably not what happened. It's this gradual process of self-organization. Jeremy England has uh, been in the media a lot about his theory of dissipative adaptation. So um, let's see. So we will see, uh, this is kind of like a different point of view. Not everybody was convinced by a mono. Uh, Carl Sagan said the origin of life must be a highly probable affair. As soon as conditions permit, up it pops. Um, so this is an important question, um, whether life was uh, improbable or inevitable. So if life is highly improbable, we're likely to be alone in the universe. But if the emergence of life is inevitable, given a certain set of common uh, physical conditions, then it's likely that we have life um, at least on planets that are sufficiently Earth-like, uh, specifically have uh, geochemistry like the Earth's, uh, ha have a star, uh, some uh, like the Earth's, because that's what uh, provides the energy that pushes it far from equilibrium. So we're going to get into all that stuff pretty soon. Um, Christian Didu, this quote is kind of a response to Stephen Jay Gould, who just really emphasized uh, to both Mano and Stephen Jay Gould, the, um, the importance of chance uh, in nature and that everything is basically, you know, a contingency that came from a chance process um, where Deduve says that, you know, you can have this inevitability that some philosophers would see as, as teleology, um, but it doesn't mean that uh, this inevitable progress is being driven by a supernatural force. Uh, he explains that the natural constraints within which chance operates are such that evolution in the direction of increasing complexity was virtually bound to take place if given the opportunity, chance does not exclude inevitability. So he was also a Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist, the same uh, category as Mono, but had the complete opposite opinion. Um, and we can talk about that too. Basically, uh, when uh, systems are open systems and they're pushed far from equilibrium by a flow of energy, you basically uh, get something like um, a statistical bias away from what we would expect with isolated systems, closed systems that aren't uh, open to energy will relax the thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, when a system is being pushed far from equilibrium, uh, it will naturally organize because uh, organization uh, happens uh, under the flow of energy. And we're going to see exactly why it's a Darwinian process. But basically, um, you get inevitability if you have the right ingredients. So um, we'll talk about to kind of frame this, we already kind of mentioned those two worldviews. So the first worldview would be the reductionist worldview. And I should be clear that um, reductionism is uh, also, it's, it's a method and an ideology, and we shouldn't uh, confuse those two things. Um, and Daniel, I guess just so I'm, you know, know where I'm at, maybe when you, when I've gone 30 minutes, you can let me know. Okay. I'll hoot. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so uh, reductionism, the method, uh, basically says that reality can be understood by breaking down all physical phenomena into their simplest parts so that we may observe the basic behavior of the fundamental constituents of nature. So um, I'm just going to plug in this charger. I might need to do that in a little bit. But um, basically, uh, the method is how science works. If we want to understand emergence, we also have to understand how the components that systems are made of uh, work in isolation. So it's an essential part of the story, but it's not the whole part we'll see. Um, so the method inspired an ideology and ideology is 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 just that it's it's an ideology and it's rigid and um basically uh the method uh doesn't really um imply that the ideology is true so um when i'm attacking reductionism i'm not at attacking the method i'm i'm attacking the worldview and so that worldview we can say that um basically um 
So hard determinism is, is part of the reductionist worldview. So a uh, thought experiment that some people are familiar with, I'm sure uh, Laplace's demon, but basically uh, Laplace was uh, a French mathematician that uh, took uh, Newton's kind of model of reality uh, and applied it to everything. Newton himself was kind of a mystic when it comes to life. He didn't really think that physics apply to, to organisms or at least to humans, but um, Laplace really, you know, came up with the idea that like, uh, basically the evolution of the universe is just this like um, clockwork universe where it's like, um, a machine with cogs that are just turning. So there are no, uh, there's no room for agency and free will in that picture. Uh, when Boltzmann came along uh, in the 19th century and uh, came up with statistical mechanics, the clockwork universe kind of became the billiard ball universe, but it's just the idea that everything in the universe is made of atoms and that these atoms are, um, interacting and that's the whole picture so the ideology says we're nothing more than our atoms so we don't make decisions uh consciousness is just uh, an epiphenomenon and it uh, feels to us like we are but actually this trajectory was determined basically uh not basically from the moment uh, of the big bang uh and there's kind of no freedom in anything and uh no future um other than what was determined from the beginning so uh, the second law of thermodynamics also sort of shaped the reductionist worldview says the universe is becoming increasingly disordered. There's actually kind of two different interpretations of the second law. Uh, the first one uh, kind of emerged from the work of uh, Carnot and Clausius, the kind of uh, original thermodynamics work where entropy was about um, a measure of uh, energy that can't be used for work. So the kind of measure of like useless energy um, where later with Boltzmann, he tried to uh, put the second law on like a statistical basis based on like atomic theory. So um, basically uh, people applied uh, Boltzmann's statistical interpretation of the second law to the universe and came up with this notion that the universe is becoming increasingly disordered, which isn't great for life because it means that life is transient and likely cosmically insignificant. And uh, this worldview is associated with materialism, uh, which doesn't recognize consciousness as real, certainly doesn't recognize it as having causal power. And historically, it often ignored uh, apparently immaterial phenomena like energy and information and mental processes. Um, I am just going to grab my charger. So, um, sounds good. This doesn't die, but I will be right back. Take your time. So, those who are watching live, please feel free to leave a comment or a question. I'm writing some things down. We'll look forward to the return of electrical power to Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My first live stream, I will be more prepared when I return to part two. That's something else I told Daniel is that this is kind of like part one that I like to come back and talk about uh the ideas that come after well, so it will have, um, we'll have 15.2 it'll be awesome it's an infinite sequence it's the sequence is always yours <laughs> great okay um so reductionist worldview says that all life forms including humans are nothing more than collections of atoms obligatorily following fixed and arbitrary mechanical trajectories determined solely by math and not by mind so um this worldview if the, if you convince someone that they don't have free will because you tell them about the reductionist worldview um there was actually a study where they did this and they uh read participants a uh, passage from francis crick explaining that uh it appears that we don't have any free will um the participants actually on subsequent tests, 
uh, were more like more likely to cheat on the test because they felt like they didn't have any personal responsibility. They weren't making the decisions, therefore they could cheat. That's kind of funny because they are actually, you can see that like by what they're like uh, being told there, they are changing uh, their behavior. So it is having some kind of effect. If we do in fact have agency or free will, and we're kind of talking about agency, uh, we don't really get into free will, but those are related topics. But if that's not true, then uh, that's really bad that the majority of scientists are telling people we don't have free will because the people that believe this, um, it's having negative effects on, for example, mental health. Other studies have shown that belief in no free will uh, can lead to depression and belief in free will can have all these positive effects. Um, of course, as soon as I start talking about free will, I'm sure a lot of people have objections, uh, might think that there's no way that we can have room for free will in a physical worldview. Um, but that's exactly what we're going to begin to talk about today, uh, the causal power of information, and that basically organisms are agents that are uh, cybernetic control units. So uh, uh, as controllers, uh, we do have agency. Um, so and the belief that we're accidents of nature rather than natural manifestations of physical laws, uh, I'm sure also uh, impacts our sense of well-being. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. Um, I can, I'll give you some quotes from really famous physicists who are uh, kind of militant reductionists. So Brian Greene says, I think it's very important to face up to the truth of reality, which is in fact that life and consciousness is a fleeting phenomenon on the entire cosmological timeline. Um, Brian Greene just came out with a book and he's like going on interviews just saying this. And it's really interesting because some other famous physicists don't agree at all. And he's stating it like it's a complete fact. So for example, David Deutsch uh, would not agree with this and we'll get into that. Um, Sabine Hostenfelder is another person. Um, I know some of the some of my friends in the community um, who are these people, you know, working on emergence and causation and stuff uh, get bothered by her statements because she is also very uh, ultra reductionistic. So I wish people would stop insisting they have free will. It's terribly annoying. Insisting that free will exists is bad science, like insisting that horoscopes tell you something about the future. It's not compatible with our knowledge about nature. So uh, I'm saying that's wrong. Uh, we won't get into free will that much, but if you have questions at the end, we will talk about how information, adaptive information, uh, gets built up by evolution in, uh, adaptive systems, complex adaptive systems. And you will see how, uh, these systems actually do control their own future. So Sam Harris is another anti-free will person says, you're not controlling the storm and you are not lost in it. You are the storm. So it's kind of funny because he's using a metaphor here, but what this story kind of reveals is that, uh, yes, we are a storm. That's right. We are a dissipative structure, like a storm uh, emerges to dissipate uh, an energy gradient. And uh, we're not really going to talk about that. That's what the first part of the book is about, the origins part. But um I'm just pointing it out because it's interesting because we are like a storm in that aspect, but we also differ from a storm because a storm does not have agency. A storm does not have the ability to seek out new energy gradients. It's just kind of um, being pushed around by these gradients in nature where uh, organisms are actually uh, controllers. And so you are storm, but you do have control over the storm. So, uh, these people are kind of have the opposite view. So Julio Tononi, uh, creator of integrated information theory says there is true free will, a uh, great lecture that just popped up, I think months ago where he gives a two hour talk on, uh, basically integrated information and, uh, how it shows that, systems do have causal power and uh, in a way uh, have free will. So depending on your definition of free will, um, 
we do at Freewell, according to his model. David Deutsch said in an interview with John Horgan just uh, a year ago or so, I'm sure we have free will. Christoph Koch says, explains how, you know, there are a lot of experiments, the Levet experiments, um, which we will talk about next time, that uh, basically uh, some people interpret it as, as not having free will, but actually uh, we will see later um, when you deliberate, uh, that's actually an act of free will. The, these choices where we're actually, where you bring your entire conscious being to that question and try to analyze it under all the various conditions. And actually, uh, there was a study Koch did that kind of showed that the Labette study uh, um, was kind of interpreted wrong. And um, for anyone who understands that stuff, uh, the readiness potential that was supposed to be proof that there was no free will disappeared when the decisions uh, involved uh, deliberation. So yeah, that's kind of meandering, but I I'm sure a lot of people are interested in this bigger picture of why this emergence paradigm is so radically different from the reductionist paradigm. It kind of uh, puts information front and center and uh, systems that process information uh, complex adaptive systems are computational systems, and these systems, uh, in the with these systems, information actually does have causal power. We're going to explain what we mean by that. So, paradigm of emergence: uh, the collective says the collective behavior of interacting parts, not simply how they function in isolation, is key to understanding the emergence and evolution of all the fascinating organisms and ecosystems that make up the biosphere. So it's really not about just like particles, it's about the patterns that emerge when uh, these systems find these certain configurations uh, through basically Darwinian mechanisms. And we'll see that self-organization too uh, has a Darwinian dynamic. Um, each emergence in the cosmic self-organization process is brought about by a higher order phase transition that moves life ever further away from a state of thermodynamic equilibrium and total disorder. I'm assuming the audience knows uh, that what thermodynamic equilibrium is. It's basically uh, if you have, for example, Boltzmann took a model of um, an ideal gas and explained that, for example, if the gas molecules are bunched up in the corner, uh, naturally it's going, the, the gas is going to spread out until there's no pattern. And uh, basically it's like a completely mixed up state. Um, so equilibrium is associated with death and disorder uh, because uh, systems naturally tend toward this more uh, mixed up, uh, unpatterned, uh, completely chaotic state. Um, of course, uh, later we're going to talk about uh, why open systems, that, that rule doesn't apply. Basically, systems that are open to the flow of energy can resist this tendency towards a disorder. And that's really what the whole story is kind of based on. Um, so through a nested series of such phase transitions, these are also called, these higher order phase transitions are Major evolutionary transitions, John Maynard Smith talked about them, and metasystem transitions by the cyberneticist uh, Valentin Turchin, uh, basically the same concept with some subtle differences. So the idea is that cosmic self-organization is a series of these uh, transitions where functional things come together to make larger functional ones, which come together to, even, to make even larger ones and so on. And through this process, adaptive complexity or life, so... That's a more general way to talk about life, uh, becomes better equipped to dominate the cosmos. Uh, life requires an organization that is increasingly hierarchical and integrated and therefore more resilient and computationally powerful. So here are just a couple of uh, figures. Um, you see this hierarchy uh, in this structural hierarchy of matter and life. This was adapted from a big physics journal. I can't remember uh, which one it was, but um, Basically, you know, physicists are recognizing this hierarchy even when it extends to life. So Jeffrey West's book, Scale, comes to mind. Uh, and so we see the hierarchy of science kind of naturally mirror this hierarchy of matter and life. 
And um, the reductionist picture would say that these things at the top here um, are kind of insignificant parts of the story, transient, um, but we will see that this, you know, the more we go up, the more influence uh, on cosmic evolution the phenomena have. So uh, Thomas Huxley's question about uh, man's place in the cosmos uh, is um, basically the, the emergence of paradigm, uh, the paradigm of emergence that I'm going to discuss. And actually, this is kind of maybe like an, a specific or a new paradigm of emergence because it includes all this stuff about thermodynamics and information theory. Um, says that emergence, the emergence and evolution of life, mind, societies, and technology are all part of one thermodynamic process, one evolutionary process, one computational process, unified by the concept of knowledge. So uh, this theory is a theory of knowledge creation. Um, and so knowledge is going to be the unifying theme, and we'll briefly talk about epistemology. I wanted to talk about it more, but it just would have been too long. Um, cosmic evolution. Uh, in this paradigm is a universal process of becoming as opposed to being. So the universe isn't this static thing. Uh, it's actually evolving very much like an organism or a complex adaptive system. Um, so it's not a panpsychic theory. In this theory, consciousness emerges. That's very important. Um, but you might call it emergent panpsychism uh, because uh, as this evolutionary process proceeds, uh, inanimate matter as life spreads gets converted into animate matter. Um, so in this picture, humans are neither a cosmic accident nor the end goal of evolution. So we are instead a step on the evolutionary ladder of becoming, and we are also potentially an essential driver of increasing cosmic complexity. So this big idea is that the universe is undergoing this majestic self-organizing process. And at this moment of time, at least in this corner of the universe, we are the stars of the show. Um, this picture is from Eric Chayson's uh, book, The Rise of Complexity, uh, Cosmic Evolution, The Rise of Complexity. Uh, he's a Harvard astrophysicist, um, but I just used a Freeman Dyson quote here because it seemed irrelevant. It's conceivable that life may have a larger role to play than we have yet imagined. Life may succeed against all odds in molding the universe to its own purpose. So I guess Brian Greene doesn't buy that at all. But um, if that's true, then uh, as, phys as cosmolog cosmologists have to think about the, the role of life. There's a lot of people who have said similar things like Seth Lloyd and famous Lee Raker as well. Um, so just a couple quotes here. So, you know, you know when, when people hear these terms progress, there's just this stigma. Uh, immediately they thought like, oh, someone's trying to sneak in religion or some intelligent design theory. Um, so you see these trusted names of physics here. David Deutsch has narrowly conceived evolutionary theory considers as mere vehicles for the replication of our genes or memes. And it refuses to address the question of why evolution has tended to create ever greater adaptive complexity or the role that such complexity plays in the wider scheme of things. So there is clearly implying that adaptive complexity does have this larger role to play. Um, we now see how it is possible for the universe to increase both organization and entropy at the same time. The optimistic and pessimistic eras of time can coexist. The universe can display creative unidirectional, unidirectional progress, even in the face of the second law. Physicist Paul Davies says that. Um, so that's really uh kind of a, a key point uh in this is that um the second law actually is in a sense driving this increase in progress so not only can we have unidirectional progress in the face of the second law uh, it seems that this progress requires the second law uh, because we'll see that the second law is the basically the natural selection pressure for uh, self-organizing systems. So in a sense, the second law is both uh, Shiva the destroyer and Brahma the creator. Um, so uh, a goal of this unifying theory of reality, uh, I've, I've been calling the great consilience. It was actually a name uh, suggested by Marco Lynn, who is a, is a Firstonian and influenced uh, some of this talk um, so 
Basically, the unifying theory of reality illuminates the connection between complexity, cognition, consciousness, and cosmic evolution, or matter, mind, and cosmos. Um, and it's really based on complexity science. It's a lot broader than complexity science, but I guess that name kind of, in a way, includes everything. So it's a unification of major sciences of our time, including but not limited to physics, biology, neuroscience, computer science, evolutionary theory, and statistics. And basically, it describes complex adaptive systems of all scales in terms of energy and information flows. So it uses statistical thermodynamics, information theory, and cybernetics. Um, so we will talk about those a bit uh, coming up. So if you want to see kind of like a, a map of what sort of informs uh, this non-reductive theory of everything, here you go. So. I know this is a lot of information, so I'll kind of try to simplify this for everyone. Um, there are some unifying paradigms that have emerged. So basically, this theory is nothing new. It's basically evolutionary epistemology. Um, after that came universal Darwinism. And later, uh, right now, we're seeing this kind of revolution with like Bayesian inference and these ideas being applied to everything. Um, so uh being informed uh by these um paradigms and uh combining those paradigms or updating them i should say with uh information from non-equilibrium thermodynamics so we're talking about the thermodynamics of open systems uh information theory so shannon's theory um some of you will know that information theory is related very closely to non-equilibrium thermodynamics and basically uh, Boltzmann's statistical entropy is mathematically the same as uh, Shannon entropy or information entropy, which is a me measure of uncertainty. Um, if I had more time, I would go through thermodynamics and the different types of entropy, but uh, we don't have time for that. But if anyone has any questions, I can clarify. Um, cybernetics was basically information theory um, applied to biology, adaptive systems. It was the first science of adaptive systems, really. And uh, it's funny, while writing this, uh, I found out because, you know, I hadn't I, I had heard the name cybernetics, but it wasn't clear how important it was. Um, in a talk by uh, Jim Crutchfeld of uh, Santa Fe Institute basically revealed that uh, because cybernetics got associated with like the Russian, uh, like during the Cold War, kind of like the Russian agenda, um, cybernetics was used to design like heat seeking missiles. Uh, Norbert Wiener's uh, theory was almost immediately applied for military uses. And because of that, it stopped being taught in American uh, colleges. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's really important and it was actually, uh, emerging at the same time as information theory. People were already, uh, thinking about systems in terms of information flows, but it's more than information theory because it's a science of feedback. Um, so dynamical systems theory or complex adaptive systems is kind of like an offshoot of that. Um, all of these inform what I've called universal Bayesianism. I'm not the only person to call it that. Um, I had searched that term and found Adam Saffron's uh, paper on integrated world modeling theory that used that same term. But uh, John Campbell has been a researcher um, who has uh, done a lot to show this equivalence between uh evolutionary processes and processes of bayesian inference we're going to talk about that in a little bit um so yeah if anybody has any questions about that but really all of these things origin of life research integrated evolutionary theory um if you haven't checked out the work of these people like everybody here is <laughs> worth reading their work but uh so from that we get the unifying theory of reality that is based on what I call the evolutionary epistemology, universal Darwinism, universal Bayesianism framework. That's a long name. I'm aware of that, but it's just to show that these three theories are basically the same theory. Um, so universal Darwinism says that the universe is evolving at every scale through both competitive evolution and through self-organization, which is cooperative evolution among agents that have formed a collective unit. So it started with Richard Dawkins and his concept of the meme and the selfish gene that 
uh, memes uh, were these uh, cultural units uh, that were equivalent to genes. And so we started to see how information was this uh, paradigm that could be extended beyond biology. And then we had Dan Dennett and Darwin's Dangerous Idea really extend this to like everything to self-organizing systems to like cultural and technological systems. Uh, evolutionary epistemology came before that. It was based on Karl Popper's philosophy, but it was actually invented by cognitive psychologist Donald Campbell. And basically that said that the evolutionary process is a problem solving procedure that creates knowledge. So uh, the information stored in genomes and in uh, brains and cultural memory, uh, basically that all that knowledge accumulates from an evolutionary process. And it's really helpful to think of it as knowledge, especially when we start to talk about this in, in uh, the context of thermodynamics and information, because uh, basically this knowledge is what allows life adaptive systems to stay far from equilibrium. They can resist this tendency towards decay. Life can uh, continue to persist if it can acquire the knowledge that it needs to essentially to find free energy that will allow it to sustain itself. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second more. Um, so universal Bayesianism is a Bayesian update of the first two paradigms. Knowledge is encoded. Uh, so the knowledge that evolutionary epistemology describe it's actually encoded in biological systems uh in the form of a world model so this model is an internal representation and statistical mapping of the environment which gets updated through adaptation and adaptive learning we're going to talk about that process um really the the, the whole Bayesian brain hypothesis and free energy principle is inspired by cybernetics heavily so ross ashby's Good regulator theorem and the law of requisite variety, which we'll talk about, was kind of the first talk of systems having models and ha having to model the environment. Um, so Carl Friston says inference is actually quite close to a theory of everything, including evolution, consciousness, and life itself. Uh, we're not going to go into those bigger implications that would be at the uh, end of the book in the last chapter, but basically, this isn't just a theory about evolution. Um, well, it is evolution, but evolution applied way more broadly. So quantum mechanics has uh, an interpretation that's consistent with this and bigger problems like the fine tuning of the constants and parameters that allow for the emergence of life in the universe. We can actually uh, probably have the best explanation for the fine tuning problem and the measurement problem of quantum mechanics uh, with this theory. Um, we won't talk about it, but just so you know, next time, uh, cosmological natural selection by Lee Smolin is the theory that kind of addresses the fine tuning problem from a universal Darwinism perspective, while quantum Darwinism uh, addresses the measurement problem. Um, so we will save that for next time, but feel free to ask questions about any of those. So what does this do? I have this name poetic metanaturalism. I meant to take that out, but uh, next time we'll get into why uh, I chose that name. It's actually, um, it sounds kind of like, you know, like complex or buzzword or jargony, but there's actually very practical reasons for having that name. Um, so this uh, unifying theory bridges matter with mine. So universal Darwinism gives us a picture of the open-ended complexity growth uh, that this whole idea is based on the idea that evolution keeps producing uh, increasingly complex and intelligent forms of life. Excuse me. Um, so uh, yeah, universal Bayesianism is uh, the link that kind of connects those paradigms with uh, consciousness. So again, we won't get into that today, but when uh, you understand that knowledge is stored, stored in the form of a world model that a system that models itself can experience, then we start to get a better understanding of like what conscious is. consciousness is. It's a, it's a mental model. So it's not a traditional panpsychic theory, even though I know Friston and Levin and some of his colleagues have kind of been flirting with panpsychism, this 
theory would say that's wrong and it's kind of uh, reduces consciousness to something trivial um, by saying that it's in everything. Like um, a proton is conscious because it's a triad of quarks that have to be in a certain configuration. So there is some minimal level of integrated information. Um, that's not enough uh, to get a conscious experience to get an observer. Um, so Saffron's integrated world modern theory says that you need a model with spatial, temporal, and causal coherence. I would also argue that it requires self-modeling capacity. Talk about that a little bit at the end if anyone's interested, um, but this theory is supposed to bridge mind with cosmic evolution. So the story starts with the second law. Um, Daniel, if there's any questions about that like intro, let me know. Yeah. Uh, if not, I can just proceed. Could I ask two questions from the chat? Sure. Okay. The first question is from Blue. Blue wrote, do you think that non-living autonomous agents with multiple competing priorities, such as self-driving cars, have free will? If not, what is the defining difference between these systems and humans? Uh, no, I don't think they have free will. So um, adaptive information is a special type of information. I do think those things, and this is kind of following Sarah Walker's lead, uh, who's at Arizona State. I think she's also SFI faculty now, but Basically, um, to have self-driving cars, you first need life. So anything like a self-driving car, that's like this information processing system. Uh, if you were to come across a broken down self-driving car on some planet and you saw that, you would have to infer that there was also life there because life is part of the trajectory to get to that. But I wouldn't say that it has free will because it's just this input output machine uh, with a defined set of algorithms and uh, adaptive systems are more flexible. Uh, and they're, okay, so in the next, <laughs> next time we'll talk about actually the emergence of agency, uh, which occurs with the origin of life or abiogenesis. And you basically, um, because this, self-organized system that would be kind of like the proto cell um, is evolving through a mechanism that a Darwinian dynamic for self-organization that we'll explain in a bit, it builds up information. And at some point there's a phase transition where the information that's getting built up in the system uh, basically uh, gains what Sarah Walker and Paul Davies call informational control. So there's a point where information actually starts calling the shots and you can see the difference between uh, systems that where there is informational control. Uh, so living systems and inanimate systems, because for example, um, inanimate systems, uh, their movement can be predicted with Newton's laws. So anyone who's taken first year physics uh, probably had to do an exercise where uh, you're trying to predict the movement of some macroscopic system, like a ball that gets kicked or pushed by a gust of wind. And what you do is you, um, you have to draw out all the forces acting on the system, and then you can understand where the system's going to go. With life, you don't need an external force for it to start, for example, climbing uphill. Um, that's internally generated. Of course, it's not magic. Uh, the adaptive system, the agent, uh, has stored energy that it's extracted from the environment. So, for example, humans that have eaten food and there's a metabolic process that's driving this. But uh, still, yeah, you, with living systems that where information has causal power, uh, basically the trajectory of the system can't be predicted by these fundamental laws of physics. Um, Philip Ball, a journalist that has been talking about this um his, his recent article which caused a lot of controversy between like the reductionists like talking about free will and agency um and there's a lot of confusion around that so people like jerry coin were like trying to shoot it down and yeah hopefully i can talk about that um i guess we'll talk about that next time because there's a lot of uh confusion about what we're saying when we say something has agency or free will. But his example is if you throw, throw a ball and a bird off a tower and you can predict 
what one is going to do. You can't predict what the other is going to do. Um, interestingly, though, I would say that the bird's not completely unpredictable. You can predict that it's not going to hit the ground. It's not going to splat on the ground. It's going to fly away. Uh, you have to understand the bird in terms of its goals. So you have to understand, you know, the bird and its environment and the information that got built up through evolution. And then we can start to predict the bird, uh, its statistical behavior. So in animate systems, you can pretty much precisely predict the movement unless they're chaotic systems, which is another story. But with life, um, yeah, it's not predictable in that same way with like low level laws of physics. But uh, I'm arguing that actually life is more predictable than we've thought. But you need things like uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and for example, uh, free energy principle. Um, so you can say that, you know, an organism will try to minimize free energy or uh, minimize the difference between uh, its models prediction and reality. So it'll try to minimize prediction error. And that's a way that we can start to describe uh, behavior statistically. So, um, yeah, was there another one? Yep, can I ask a second question? Yeah, I, I know I didn't completely answer that, but uh, that will require like the, all of the points that I would get into in the second talk. But it's a great question. Yeah. I would have written in a larger margin if I had more time. The second question is from Joseph Clark, who wrote, uh, first complimented your talk and let you knew that you were an interesting guy. Thanks. So then the question was, how far do you think the universe can organize itself and what does that look like? Okay, great. That's a perfect question to lead into the next part. And hopefully by the end of this, uh, we will have some sort of answer for that, which is good because I, when I started making the beginning of the presentation, I was going to get to consciousness and free will and I ran out of time. So there's been a lot of talk about things that I won't get to, but that we will get to. Um, so uh, the story starts with the second law. Um, so the second law of thermodynamics, as popularly, popularly understood, says that uh, systems naturally become increasingly disordered. Um, that's really just because of the large scale effects of chance. So there are many ways to be disordered and there are relatively fewer ways to be patterned. Um, so a system that's this collective of particles so this evolving ensemble of particles uh, will naturally tend to move towards a configuration that's completely spread out and mixed up there are no uh, energy gradients so no work can be extracted that's a state of equilibrium so we are going to use this word thermodynamic equilibrium uh, to mean death and disorder so life wants to resist the tendency towards equilibrium it wants to stay ordered uh, what's interesting about this is that it applies to all this is kind of like where the free energy principle in Friston's Bayesian brain hypothesis it, it, it frames everything this way so I thought it was a good way to kind of frame it here is that you start with the second law and any conceivable system any ordered system for it to continue to persist has to resist this uh, tendency so um, basically, uh, Schrodinger, the guy everybody knows from quantum mechanics and the, and the cat thought experiment, he wrote a book called What is Life in the 40s and uh, basically kind of solved this paradox. Like if there's a second law and things become more disordered then what's with life and what's with the biosphere and all of this complexity that we see around us. And he explained, actually Boltzmann explained this before him, um, but Boltzmann said a lot to contradict this as well, um, or just didn't follow this to its implications. But uh, Schrodinger explained that open systems uh, by feeding off uh, free energy in the environment. So free energy is just energy that uh, you can extract work from. So it's ordered energy as opposed to energy that's been dissipated in the form of heat. You can't extract energy uh, uh, useful energy from that energy. It's still there. It's just spread out and it's, it's, you can't harness it. Collecting it would cost more than you'd get out of it. So, um, Schrodinger explained that, uh, 
if a system can get free energy, which he called negative entropy or energy, uh, neg entropies was called by uh, someone later. Um, so to understand how ordered systems stay ordered, uh, you basically need to understand that they have to uh, constantly be extracting free energy from the environment. The moment that they can't extract more free energy is the moment that the system dies and decays to equilibrium. So um, basically, uh, the second law is not violated by life because um, in this effort to stay far from equilibrium, life, it keeps extracting that ordered free energy and keeps dissipating it as heat. So, uh, so it's basically exporting entropy into the environment. So the order um, that is maintained uh, is paid for by the dissipated energy, which com becomes thermal entropy. So there are multiple definitions of entropy. So you have thermal entropy, which is heat entropy, and then statistical entropy, uh, which explains thermal entropy, but it has a broader domain of application. So you can talk about a shuffling a deck of cards and you can talk about like the statistical entropy increasing uh, if the deck is ordered and it starts becoming mixed up through the shuffling. But the deck of cards, the thermal entropy uh, isn't changing much at all. So there's different types of entropy. There's also information entropy, which has to do with the, um, uh, the number of messages that could be sent across the channel instead of... Um, the number of states that a system can be in, the number of microstates without changing the macro state, macro state or uh, the kind of um, collective properties of the system. Uh, there's a really neat relationship between statistical entropy and information entropy, which I won't talk about here. It was really fleshed out by uh, E.T. Jaynes. Uh, but yeah, so information and entropy like, go hand in hand. Um, just to give a little more context before we get into the details, uh, David Deutsch in this great TED talk um, called After Billions of Years of Monotony, the Universe is Waking Up, says, if one can speak of a cosmic war, it's a war between monotony and novelty, mm -hmm. between stasis and creativity, and in this war, our side is not destined to lose. If we choose to apply our unique capacity to create explanatory knowledge, we could win. So that's very different than Brian Greene's story. And it kind of gets at the second question that was asked there. How, how far can this complexity increase go? And so this kind of foreshadows that maybe it doesn't have a limit. And that seems, you know, most people think that would go against the second law of thermodynamics. We're going to see why that's not necessarily true. Um, but you can also see this cosmic war as this fight between order versus disorder, life versus entropy, and knowledge versus uncertainty or ignorance. Um, but is life's battle against disorder uh, good versus evil or yin and yang? So I'm going to kind of argue that these two things kind of have this, uh, you could describe their relationship as causally dependent. And it's kind of like this dialectic between life and uh, disorder. Um, and it is through this sort of uh, interaction that uh, creates progress. So we have some Eastern ideas mentioned again, um, but I, when I was writing the book, a friend that practices Buddhism called me and told me about this interdependent co-arising idea, which I thought was really cool. So we're gonna come up with this, what we call Popper's principle, which is uh, problems create progress. We're gonna see that this problem of entropy, that this tendency towards decay is what actually uh, forces systems to evolve. Basically, it forces them to search what's called the configuration space or the phase space or the state space to find configurations that are good at extracting energy. And that allows it to stay far from equilibrium. So we're going to have some figures soon. So this stuff that's kind of abstract becomes a little bit more concrete. Just out of respect to the earlier request, how about you check the time and feel then how fast you'd like to continue however much you want to present. And then if you want to take any questions, but first just check the time and let just, I, 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 how, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't 
uh, noticed when we started. So about how long have I been going? I would say five, zero minutes. Really? Okay. How long can we go? We can go another uh, 99 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to go through it a little bit faster. Um, but yeah, so... Um, but if we use all the time, I told you yesterday that I was feeling, uh, oh, I had a sore throat and uh, the sore throat's better today. I'm hopped up on cold medicine. I'm sure I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to pay for it tomorrow. But um, yeah, if we use all the time with questions, that would be good. Uh, so in our everyday exper experience, things don't naturally become ordered unless someone intervenes, rooms get messier, buildings erode. Uh, so we already talked about this Schrodinger's solution. So we can think of life as a game. Uh, so life has always been playing a game against the second law of thermodynamics. There is another narrative that I won't go into, but life is also an energy flow channel. So life by existing and computing and trying to stay far from equilibrium is also increasing entropy. Uh, actually, the universe of life will increase entropy at a faster rate than a universe without life, um, which is pretty interesting. So it's, again, not necessarily that life is like battling against entropy. And in, in many ways, it increases entropy. But there's also this story, I guess, what it's trying to battle is the tendency towards disorder. So it depends on what type of entropy you're talking about. Um, so the challenge in the game of life, which applies to you as well as other simpler adaptive systems, is to resist that tendency. So this gives life a goal or a teleology. So teleology was associated with kind of this mystical thing, but basically we'll, we're seeing that teleology is just uh, agency. It's just a result, goal-oriented behavior as a result of the information that's been accumulated over evolution. So teleology, uh, the book uh, tries to naturalize teleology and just say that there are these goal-oriented systems that behave different uh, because they are acquiring information through Darwinian evolution. Um, so life has to extract free energy. That's how it stays in the game of life. And to extract free energy, it's, it's not a simple task. So the computational task of extracting free energy uh, requires that the uh, system acquire information about its environment. Otherwise, it can't find energy. Uh, it also requires that the system model its environment. So the information is creating this predictive model, this generative model. And it is um, that model that allows it to continuously find free energy. Um, so we will explain that life strategy is it searches through a configuration space for solutions to the problem of survival through trial and error search, uh, variation and selection. So we, we know about evolution. There's this genetic variation in natural selection. And, uh, we're going to argue that that process, that mechanism is much broader. The evolutionary mechanism is actually the mechanism of the scientific method and of adaptive learning. Um, and that mechanism is also a process that accumulates evidence-based knowledge. So it's also a process of Bayesian inference. We're going to explain why. So here we have those different mechanisms with different names. Um, so it's not included here, but uh, so if life is a game, there are levels to this game. Uh, and the levels we're going to see are these uh, evolutionary transitions every time life graduates to this uh, more uh, complex uh, hierarchical system, like when single-celled organisms come together to form a multicellular organism and multicellular organisms come together to form communities like societies, uh, that you can uh, view these evolutionary transitions as, as life graduating to a new level. So, um, we're going to talk about how adaptive information gets built up through evolution and uh we're calling that knowledge it's nice to have that word knowledge because this process of an adaptive system acquiring this information is actually reducing its uncertainty about the environment so it's it's reducing its ignorance about all the ways the surrounding world could potentially surprise it 
Uh, so knowledge is a nice word. Some philosophers, like old school philosophers, might have issue with that um, because in some teachings, like knowledge is something that like conscious beings with like awareness have. But we're calling any adaptive information knowledge, and it's got more of a technical definition because knowledge is that information which reduces. Uh, uncertainty, and you could actually quantify this process of evolution. Terence Deacon has talked a lot about how you can do that with uh, information measures. Um, so just to explain this, why is knowledge something that matters? Like, does it have causal power? Or is it all just this, this billiard ball universe where it's like these particles bumping into each other, and you can basically use uh, fundamental laws of physics to describe like the trajectory of all of the particles in the universe. This is saying no, that uh, the information that gets built up through evolution has causal power such that these systems start to behave in ways that are different than what would be predicted from uh, something like Newton's laws. So we also have this process of anti-accretion that Sarah Walker likes to talk about. Uh, but anti, so anti-accretion is uh, basically, we're familiar with uh, planets pulling in matter, so bodies like asteroids, because uh, gravity pulls matter in naturally, but anti-accretion is when a planet is ejecting matter. And uh, in many cases, what, well, so the, the only time we really see anti-accretion uh, is when you have a planet with life on it. So um, right now, uh, bits of biosphere, so humans and space rockets are being sent to other celestial bodies. So that's a form of anti-accretion, uh, sending up satellites. You won't see a satellite get sent out. If you see that in the universe, uh, like you're looking at some other solar system and you see a body uh, sent out and put into orbit from a planet, that's an indication that life is there. That's a biosignature. Um, so she says that Anti-accretion requires comprehenders, specifically the existence of physical systems with knowledge of Newton's laws. Um, so what does it all mean? Um, it means we need knowledge uh, to uh, keep us out of thermodynamic e equilibrium. Um, so how do we acquire knowledge? Uh, science is the most uh, is the most salient example of the causal power of knowledge. So science uh, has uh, eradicated lethal diseases, built a global communication network called the internet and created weapons of apocalyptic power. It's not always good, this power of knowledge, but um, uh, we see that there's something about the scientific method which is efficient at uh, accumulating knowledge. So we're going to talk about why, and that's where we get into Karl Popper and evolutionary epistemology. Um, so we know knowledge is important. Karl Popper says we're always faced with practical problems, and out of these grow sometimes theoretical problems, for we try to solve some of our problems by proposing theories. So uh, Popper stresses that all of science starts with a problem, either theoretical or practical. Um, and it is that problem that forces us to seek out a solution. So we can already see why this principle that I've called Popper's principle uh, uh, says that problems create progress. So some of these theories that we make to try to solve our problems will be wrong. There'll be errors. Um, but the idea with science is that those errors get filtered out by a process of testing your theories and a peer review process, which gives criticism. So uh, knowledge is really, uh, for knowledge, for us to know that some piece of information is knowledge, it really needs to be tested. And uh, we call that evidence-based knowledge or evidence-based information. So it's really the only true kind of knowledge because you don't know if something's true until you test it. For example. Um, the world doesn't look round from a naive perspective. It looks flat. So, for example, um, someone who had the first idea, you know, 
and I'm sure it was before anybody famous we knew someone had this idea and probably people blew it off. But um, uh, some things that are true about reality are not immediate, immediately apparent from like sensory observation from sense data. So we really need to test our theories if we are going to be sure about them. Um, so what Popper found out was the scientific method is an algorithm. He called that algorithm conjecture and refutation. And uh, basically, this is the method of hypothesis testing. So you have a problem you believe can be solved. You make an informed guess or conjecture to see if your theory can be refuted, uh, proved false by testing its predictions. So uh, people have pointed out, like John Campbell, uh, Carl Friston, that uh, science is a process of inference. So it recognizes statistical patterns and trends in nature that we can use to make increasingly accurate predictions. Um, it would not be inaccurate then to say that the function or purpose of science is to generate predictive knowledge. Um, and we can char characterize that as a process of inference, which basically means that scientists draw logical conclusions about the way the world works uh, based on evidence-based information acquired in the past but with an ever-present awareness that the information can and will lead to, um, to new conclusions and deeper understanding. So when we recognize this, we also have to recognize that all of our models will have uncertainty. Um, so we should never think that our model's right. Every model is going to be proved wrong in some way, but through the scientific process, uh, the idea is that we get closer and closer to truth. So we can never reach perfect truth, but in this model, you can actually get closer to it. So in some senses, it's different than like postmodernist philosophy that says there is no objective truth. There is an objective truth, um, uh, but we can never know it, but we can get closer to it. Uh, so once Popper understood that knowledge, the knowledge generating mechanism behind science success was conjecture and refutation, he realized that human learning, which begins at birth and continues to death, uses the same problem solving algorithm although the developmental psychology literature called the method trial and error. So because life is constantly presenting us with new challenges, such as the need to get from one place to another, a problem that inspires babies to learn to walk, we must constantly try out new behavioral solutions. We can think of these actions as guesses about how to survive, or if you prefer, experiments in evading equilibrium or predictions for persistence, and they will often fail. Um, so, this is Dan Dennett's idea of life exploring this design space. We're going to talk about how it does so through evolution, but we're still talking about science here and adaptive learning. On an abstract level, we can imagine a certain practical problem as a challenge, one with a solution that exists somewhere out there in the space of possibilities, just waiting to be found by someone sufficiently motivated and clever. It may take some time, but if the possibility space, the space of possible solutions, is continuously explored in an efficient way, eventually a solution will be discovered. So, excuse me, trial and error learning explores the solution space. Um, so just to give you a, a clear example of how adaptive learning uh, is kind of this form of hypothesis testing. So whenever we have a problem in life and we don't know the correct solution to a problem in advance, um, we naturally begin with those potential solutions that are closer to our starting point in the solution space we're sampling. So for example, if a baby reaches for its bottle, and barely misses, it'll adjust its behavior slightly, which minimizes the chances of making an error. Um, so our instincts may nudge us in the general direction of a solution, but the instinct alone is not enough. Uh, we have to try out what you could call a behavioral conjecture, and when it fails, uh, we uh, try something new. So that's kind of like a new theory. And uh, it's essentially the old one, but with a little twist. And if that behavioral solution is remembered, then it gets stored for future use, ready to be repeated, but also adapted if necessary. Um, but in humans, so the baby example, reaching for the bottle, let's say it misses the bottle, it won't get a reward signal. It won't get a little surge of dopamine. So if it corrects and it gets closer, it gets a little reward signal. This is reinforcement learning, but basically this adaptive learning process is a process of making theories and eliminating those theories that are errors. So uh, Popper saw that scientific knowledge and the evolutionary process uh, were also connected. So 
not only it's science uh, adaptive learning, uh, both of those things are extensions of the evolutionary process. So he says, in science, theories are highly competitive. We discuss them critically, we test them, and we eliminate those theories which we judge to be less good in solving the problems which we wish to solve. So only the best theories, those which are most fit, survive in the struggle. This is the way science grows. Um, so that's kind of nice, like showing you really how this is an evolutionary process. Um, not only is science an evolutionary process, the converse is true. Evolution is a scientific process. So it is clear, this is another quote, it is clear that this view of the progress of science is very similar to Darwin's view of natural selection by the way of the elimination of the unfit, of the errors in the evolution of life, the errors in the attempts at adaptation, which is a trial and error process. Analogously, science works by trial, theory making, and by the elimination of errors. Um, I might pause in a second just to um, see if everybody understands this, but I have a few more slides. So um, evolutionary algorithms uh, also use this mechanism, but it's called generate and test. So I didn't mention this, uh, the mechanism of evolution is variation and selection. So we have these algorithms that are equivalent, conjecture and refutation, trial and error, variation and selection. We also have generate and test. So in machine learning, evolutionary algorithms uh, have this method uh, generate and test. Um, possible solutions are generated until an actual solution is found. And these solutions accumulate in some memory store while the errors are filtered out and forgotten. In science, the solutions are theories or models that accurately predict some natural phenomenon. And the successful ones accumulate in peer reviewed journals and textbooks. So. Um, we see that these processes are equivalent, and we're actually going to see that it's this Bayesian process, uh, that adaptation is also a process of uh, the model of the organism uh, becoming optimized, uh, decreasing its prediction error so that it can more efficiently extract free energy from an itch to stay ordered. So we get this principle. Um, that all evolutionary processes are learning processes and all learning processes are evolutionary processes. Um, Conrad Lorenz, a Nobel Prize winning zoologist, was also a pioneer of evolutionary epistemology and he made the statement, life is a cognitive process. Um, so if this is true and there's this functional equivalence between the mechanisms driving evolution, learning and science, then that implies that adaptation uh, or the genetic information that um, uh, corresponds to those physical adaptations are uh, equivalent, is equivalent to scientific knowledge. They're actually the same thing. So to kind of make this relationship clear, biological adaptation represents knowledge of the environment and the knowledge we acquire through learning and science reflects adaptation to the environment. So we see that there's no meaningful distinction between adaptive information and scientific knowledge. Both allow life to predict an uncertain world, control matter, constrain chaos, and construct order from disorder. So the very same property that is responsible for organic matter leaving the planet in spaceships, so this anti-accretion, uh, is the same uh, property that allows organisms to climb uphill, seemingly defying the force of gravity. Of course, uh, the laws of physics aren't violated in any way, but uh, living systems are not uh, constrained by the laws of physics the way inanimate systems are. So some examples, a dolphin streamlined design, which is a product of the information stored in its genome, contains the knowledge of hydrodynamics. An eagle's wing design contains the knowledge of aerodynamics. Not only can we be certain that engineers see knowledge in these functional structures, uh, there should be little doubt that they inspired uh, our machines. And, and without that information, I don't think we would have come to those inventions, at least not anytime soon. Um, camouflage uh, on an organism uh, represents knowledge of the environment. So kind of bridging this idea of evolutionary epistemology, that evolution builds up knowledge, and that science is an extension of the evolutionary process. Uh, making a bridge between that and Bayesian inference, uh, 
requires this uh, relationship between adaptation and statistical correlation. So physicist Carlo Rivelli, which who has gotten really interested in explaining how this information that underlies agency, that behavior that we see with living systems, gets built up through evolution. Uh, he wrote a great essay. It won the Foundational Questions Institute essay contest um, uh, a few years ago, but um, this work was based on the work of David Wolpert and Artem Kolchinsky, Artem e. Kolchinsky, and um, basically uh, shows how this uh, adaptation builds up information in the system. That information is really statistical correlation between the organism and its environment. So here's the simplest example. It's a bacterium performing chemotaxis. Um, so a bacterium, so chemotaxis is basically uh, a bacterium will uh, swim in the direction of food and swim away from toxins. So basically it's detecting this chemical gradient that it follows. Um, but so we can see in this example, um, and this isn't the case for all species, but you can imagine that a bacterium that swims to the left when nutrients are on the left uh, prospers compared to a bacterium that swims at random. Um, so uh, with this behavior where it's swimming towards food, um, that is the product of a chance mutation. So it's in, in some sense, it's an accident. But when it discovers that solution, that organism is more likely to reproduce. So that solution gets retained in the population. It gets sort of frozen, hardwired in. And um, so the process of adaptation is a process that builds up a statistical correlation between the system, the agent, and its environment. And so that sh shared statistical correlation represents mutual information. So mutual information is information that's shared between the environment and the organism. And uh, just to explain that a little bit more, uh, this correlation, uh, basically, as this correlation gets built up, it's creating predictive knowledge. So um, John Maynard Smith cites Fred Dretzky, who did kind of the pioneering work applying Shannon's information theory to try to quantify evolution. So Dretzky argues that if some variable A is correlated with the second variable B, then we can say that B carries information about A. For example, if the occurrence of rain is correlated with a particular cloud, then the type of cloud tells us whether it would rain. So that's from a great essay called The Concept of Information in Biology. Um, so we can see that you have this little rhyming equation here, adaptation equals statistical correlation equals mutual information. Uh, and because that uh, uh, shared information allows the organism to predict its environment better, uh, this process is also a process of model optimization. So the predictive model of the organism, uh, as it adapts, starts to become more accurate. Uh, and so this whole process can be seen as a free energy minimization process. Um, of course, that's information theoretic free energy. It's the free energy of Friston's principle. We're not talking about thermodynamic free energy. Anyone wants to ask a question or gets confused about that, let me know. But it's basically, uh, those things are related. And it's something that's not mentioned enough. Uh, minimizing information theoretic free energy, which is just minimizing the prediction error of your model, is what allows the organism to minimize environmental free energy. So by acquiring information, reducing the information theoretic free energy allows the organism to extract energy and reduce thermodynamic free energy. It minimizes the free energy in the environment and converts it into entropy. So, we kind of see how this is getting into universal Bayesianism as it becomes more correlated, it gains information about its niche and therefore becomes a better predictor of that niche. Um, so that's what adaptation is. It's the genome of the species accumulating information that reduces the average organism's uncertainty regarding the environment. So um, 
the genome is a knowledge repository of solutions to environmental challenges that allows an organism with no brain and no mind to anticipate events in the environment. So in this theory, as I mentioned before, consciousness comes later. It comes with self-modeling capacity and uh, a bacterium would be kind of a zombie agent. It would have agency and it would move with purpose, but that is not enough for mind or at least mind in, in, defined as consciousness. Uh, if you want to say that mind is just information processing, then yes, there is mind in these systems, but that's very different than saying that the system has a subjective experience uh, and a first person perspective that will come in the next talk, but that uh, it's, it's harder. <laughs> Um, so that information stored in memory is integrated into a statistical or predictive model that determines the causal control system's behavioral repertoire or the full range of behaviors an organism is capable of. And it is this mapping of sensory inputs to motor outputs that makes the organism move in ways that we normally associate with mind or consciousness. Um, Carl Friston in a great Eon article says all biological processes can be construed as performing some form of inference. I think I already read that. Um, but the free energy principle, for those who aren't familiar, um, we've already explained it, but the Bayesian brain hypothesis and the free energy principle are the same thing. Uh, the difference is that the free energy principle applies to all other adaptive systems where the other one is just focusing on brains. But Friston realized that this, you know, is a, is a model and a process that applies to any system that's trying to resist the tendency towards disorder. So any system to stay, to continue persisting longer than we would expect, uh, naturally, it must engage in Bayesian-like learning to deal with environmental uncertainty. How much time do I have left, roughly? Uh, still more than enough. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Um, I'm definitely more than half through, I'd say I'm um, two thirds of the way through. So uh, John Campbell has this great uh, paper called Universal Darwinism as a process of Bayesian inference that I kept coming across as I was trying to understand uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics and information theory. Um, yeah, I should say actually, I should have got in the books, uh, showed you each book, but um, there's a great book called The Origin and Nature of Life on Earth by uh, Santa Fe Institute's Eric Smith and Harold Morowitz. Uh, Morowitz was a professor of mine. Eric uh, is a friend that uh, we would have these foundations of the mind uh, guild. It was like a consciousness club that would meet at the Krasnow Institute where I got my PhD. And um, so their book, The Origin of Life, on the origin of life in chapter eight actually gets into this information theory and uh this this bayesian inference and describes the origin of life and the evolution of life as uh a process of bayesian model selection and so that was kind of what connected non-equilibrium statistical mechanics to these to this bayesian brain hypothesis and i realized that you know these theories were kind of converging on the same ideas. So John Campbell wrote this paper in 2016. He says, Bayesian inference is an algorithm for the accumulation of evidence-based knowledge. This algorithm is now seen to operate over a wide range of evolutionary processes, including natural selection, the evolution of mental models and cultural evolutionary processes, notably including science itself. So uh, when we say that evolution is a process of Bayesian model selection, and the book I mentioned with Eric and Morowitz uh, actually characterized evolution as an inference engine, uh, we're basically saying that when organisms that aren't fit get weeded out, uh, that's basically models that aren't predictive getting eliminated. So the organisms that persist are the models that we're able to predict the environment best. So inference and prediction are kind of the same thing uh, since the word inference is a little obscure, I guess. Um, so just to make this point a little more clear, um, since nature is complex and intrinsically unpredictable, uh, the model of an organism is at some point guaranteed to fail when reality surprises it with the unexpected. So, uh, and that's what the free energy, free energy principle is about. Minimizing surprise is the same thing as minimizing prediction error. 
So an organism gets eaten by a predator, a baby fails to reach his bottle, a scientific theory fails to explain new data. Um, basically, when any of these things happens, it means that the model used to predict reality is not completely accurate. It contains a certain amount of prediction error and needs to be corrected. So what's the solution? Try something new. The old model worked well enough up to that point, so don't ditch it. Just vary it a bit and see if it performs better. If it does not reduce surprise, eliminate that variant and try again. If prediction error is reduced, replace the old model with the new one so that it becomes the reigning theory and the design template for new variants to be based upon. When a model has been updated in this way due to natural selection, adaptive learning, or experimental testing, we can say that knowledge has been acquired and environmental uncertainty reduced. So here we have an image. Um, I should say that uh, Infinity Maps, a uh, German software mapping company, uh, helped me create these images. Uh, Oliver Wan, I I have to uh, give a big thanks to him. Um, this image has a little bit more going on than I would want right now, but you could see that um, basically this represents two different mechanisms for uh, learning and adaptation. So this one on the top that we're gonna talk about first is the normal uh, competitive evolution, sort of Darwinian survival of the fittest. While this mechanism over here is the mechanism of self-organization. Um, so let's first talk about the normal type of evolution we're familiar with and show that how this process of evolution that works through variation and selection actually uh, generates predictive information and uh, creates a, a model uh, which is uh, which encodes knowledge of the biologically relevant regularities in the environment. So first we have this, this is a, a bacterium over here. And so this is the simplest model. Um, you have an organism that's an embodied theory or a best guess about how to stay far from equilibrium. So evolutionary epistemology sees organisms themselves as embodied theories. So evolution is basically testing these different models so uh it basically reproduces and we know that because there are going to be um errors in uh in, in that process uh the genome will get changed uh slightly and you will get a generation of progeny that all uh, are slightly different they have slightly different configurations. Um, some of these configurations will be better at extracting energy and predicting the environment than others. And the ones that uh, aren't good at predicting the environment, they get filtered out by natural selection. So here we see design four is the winning design because it's the best predictor and it's the best predictor because it's the best extractor of energy. And so that uh, design uh that that organism gets to reproduce and then you have another generation uh of designs that are slightly different and this process is an iterative process just like science uh, and hypothesis testing so um over generations you will start to get uh designs that are better adapted to the environment which we've explained means that they will be more correlated with the environment and being more correlated means being a better predictor. Um, so the knowledge that's left over after this process is the adaptive information stored in genetic material that reduces environmental uncertainty. And you see that this process will ultimately lead to the evolution towards the, the best possible design. So it's, it's an optimization. A lot of people don't think that evolution is optimizing anything. There's been this, you know, kind of philosophy that evolution does just good enough. But we actually see that in terms of the computation that it does to stay far from equilibrium, that it's actually optimized for being almost maximally efficient with its use of energy. It approaches something close to what's called the land hour limit, which David Wolpert at SFI has written about. But uh uh, life is much more efficient uh, with computation in terms of energy 
uh, supply needed compared to all of our technology. So the human brain can do uh, solve problems that even our best like AI systems can't solve. And it does so running on uh, the equivalent of one uh, household light bulb. So we'll come back to this self-organization process. Oh, well, actually we'll get into that right now. So this is the normal uh, process that we think about when we think about evolution generating knowledge, predictive knowledge. And so that's called phylogenetic learning. Uh, phylogenetic refers to these like generations. So the learning is generational. The organisms don't really learn because they don't have brains. They're not able to update their model in real time. So learning is at the level of the population. And for learning to occur, organisms have to die. Before brains, basically, you have to have this uh, competition uh, for there to be a, a learning process. However, there's also self-organization when these organisms don't compete, but actually find a configuration, find it, discover a collective configuration through their somewhat random interactions with each other. And when they find this collective configuration through trial and error, um, basically the configurations that are better at extracting energy will be the ones that are retained. Um, so, Donald Campbell, father of evolutionary epistemology, uh, explained this process, this evolutionary process by which self-organization works as blind variation and selective retention, or we can think of it as selection for persistence or stability. So fitness kind of, there's a Dawkins quote, I think I come out where Richard Dawkins said, Darwin's uh, survival of the fittest is really um, just a more specific instance of a more general law of survival of the stable. So when we think about being fit at the beginning, we're talking about just being uh, stable, being able to find energy. If you can't do that, it doesn't matter whether you have agents that you're competing with or not, because if you can't get energy, it doesn't matter if there are other people competing for it, that you won't survive. So you don't need replication with variation to evolve. That's what this is. This model is saying. Um, and Stuart Kaufman from the Santa Fe Institute has been talking about the importance of this marriage between Darwinian evolution and self-organization. But basically, uh, because there's not this replication process, um, this is how evolution occurs. So you have uh, a system that's a collection of components, parts. These parts can be molecules or they could be uh, agents. And when these molecules are pushed far from equilibrium by a flow of energy, of course, humans are eating food and metabolizing energy. So they're being powered by energy flows as well. The system blindly explores various configurations in the space of possible designs via trial and error. So the system will move through a series of configurations and those configurations that allow the system to extract sufficient energy to stay out of equilibrium will get retained while the configurations that don't allow for energy extraction will, will get filtered out. Either the system will collapse and have to try a new configuration um, or it'll just revert to the, the previous stable uh, configuration and it will continue trying to uh, explore that configuration space. Um, I should have said like, here's a good example, like here's a depiction of this configuration space. We're talking about life exploring the design space. So basically you have a, a design or configuration and then uh, you get these uh, different, this exploration of different configurations that are very close to the configuration you started out with. So, you know, I was thinking about giving a talk on the origin of life, but I couldn't get into all this cool Bayesian stuff. That's what the first part of the book is about. What's really interesting is that we're finding that self-organization, as mentioned, is a Darwinian process. So there's actually a name for this, dissipative adaptation, and it shows that this evolution towards these more stable configurations dissipate more energy, 
when this happens at the level of organisms that we're talking about, it shouldn't be surprising that it dissipates more energy because basically as the organism evolves to be better at extracting energy, all that energy it's extracting to maintain far from equilibrium is being converted into thermal entropy. So all self-organizing processes are really dissipative adaptation processes at different levels. So this process philosophers would say is multiply realizable. So this process can happen at different scales. And that's exactly what we see like right here, the same process. So you would have like a society like exploring different governance systems and it doesn't know which government system is going to work the best beforehand. It tries it. If it doesn't work well, like the fall of Rome, um, it will collapse and then it will reassemble. Um, so just to wrap up the origin of life. So we have this process of dissipative adaptation and if it's being pushed by the flow of energy and it's doing this process here where it's finding increasingly uh, stable configurations, collective configurations, then um, uh, basically what will emerge is an autocatalytic set. We'll define that later, but basically uh, it's an, I'm losing a lot of terms from philosophy. I was going to say like an, it's the beginning of an autopoetic agent. So like a self-maintaining agent in its simplest form is a chemical system that produces outputs, which are then fed back into the system so that the system can uh, self-amplify. It's basically creating all of the molecules uh, that it needs to grow. And uh, it's thought that this process you know, occurred, um, the, the autocatalytic set is kind of the precursor for the first cell. So it's kind of like a proto cell. And um, it was thought to occur uh, around hydrothermal vents, which are underwater volcanoes. There's all this energy flowing up from the, the, the hot core running through geochemical energy. And there's these rocky pores uh, in the rocks around hydrothermal vents, which provide something like a, a, a membrane, like a lipid membrane to hold the components in, a Markov blanket. So the, the pores in the rocks were the Markov blanket for the autocatalytic set. And uh, Eric Smith and Marwitz showed that basically feeding off inorganic inputs, like carbon molecules, like not, not anything, not organic chemistry where it's like life, but just like simple, like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, feeding off those inputs. Um, basically, the metabolic process, uh, it's called the reverse Krebs cycle. So uh, that process allowed uh, the first autocatalytic set to continuously self-amplify um, through, this, through this process. So if this process is allowed to continue, um, further self-organization may eventually lead to the emergence of an organic computer that can process, integrate, and store information about the world. So what dissipative adaptation is doing is uh, as it's doing this blind variation and selective retention process, and it's finding more stable configurations, those more stable configurations are also predictive of the environment. So this dissipative adaptation process is this autocatalytic set modeling the surrounding energy landscape. So I'm arguing that this is where modeling begins. It even begins before what we call life, like rep self-replicating life and its dissipative adaptation, which is a process of modeling the, the energy in the environment, the energy sources. Um, so uh, this isn't just one continuous process. There are these leaps that are phase transitions, basically. We, we've heard of phase transitions in physics and chemistry uh, courses where you have like um, uh, water um, being heated up and then transitioning into a gas or the reverse when a gas becomes frozen, uh, you get a state of order that emerges. Um, these uh, transitions towards uh, these configurations that are good at extracting energy, those uh, have also been characterized 
as phase transitions. So Eric uh, Smith, who I mentioned before, and Harold Morowitz, they have this phase transition theory of life, which basically uh, explains how um, information gains control in these systems. Um, and Sarah Walker and Paul Davies' work on this basically show that through this process of blind variation and selective retention, information gets built up in this autocatalytic set. And at some point, there's what they call algorithmic takeover uh, or informational control. And the system becomes an agent that can start to steer and control itself uh, in ways that wouldn't be predicted by physics. So uh, living system is very much like, we didn't talk about dissipative structures, but like tornadoes, whirlpools, those things emerge to dissipate an energy gradient. Uh, living things, uh, because of the process of metabolism, we are this cycling system, this thermodynamic energetic loop. Um, uh, but, uh, what was I going to say about that? Um, so yeah, we are like the storm, but we do have control over the storm. We're a storm with control. So it doesn't really make sense going back to Sam Harris's quote that you are the storm, you do not control it. And it's literally the information that gets built up through evolution that allows, you know, us being this dissipative structure, like a storm to start controlling its own behavior. Um, so the last part is just an argument for that second question, why should complexity increase? Um, we know that this evolutionary process where you build up this model, uh, so we would think that this, after these generations of evolution, this organism is gonna be well adapted to its environment, but we know that adaptation doesn't mean becoming more complex always. So sharks and crocodiles are cited as species that haven't evolved much at all in many millions of years. Um, cave fish actually evolved to become more simple. So basically fish with eyes got isolated in like an underground environment where there was no uh, need for sunlight. And uh, so basically um, fish like processing light, like eyes didn't have any survival advantage. So um, basically fish lost their eyes uh, over many generations of evolution becoming simpler. So if that's true, why should evolution increase complexity? Um, the answer to that, it comes from this understanding that evolutionary epistemology says that a species adapting to a niche is like a scientific theory being tested for viability. A species will evolve not to become increasingly complex, but to match the complexity of the environment a sort of simplest solution to the thermodynamic problem of staying far from equilibrium. So Einstein famously said, a theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. The same could be said about an organism. You want it to be as simple as possible while it accomplishes its task of extracting energy. It has to be complex enough to be able to extract energy in a competitive environment, but a bacterium doesn't have to do, it doesn't need intelligence. Any extra information processing, higher level cognition would be energy wasted um, that could be energy that allows it to stay far from equilibrium for longer and replicate more. So um, it's not the case that everything will evolve towards higher complexity. Uh, but the reason that we do get increasingly complex species over evolutionary time in a way that I'm saying is inevitable. Uh, so there is a progressive evolutionary process that leads to higher forms. It has to do with uh, niche emergence. So, so basically a species will evolve to become as complex as its niche, as its environmental niche, but there will be increasingly complex niches that emerge uh, for reasons that will be explained. Um, but I will pause there uh, before I get to that, which will be what we end on. There are no other questions right now. So if anyone does have questions, 
how about they can feel free to ask it during this last section give you a second to catch your breath and i know it's been a ton of information like my goal is that you know since this is being recorded it'll be something that's up um hopefully i've cited enough literature that people can explore this stuff themselves and see that like okay it's not this guy that's like a uh, kook claiming to have like a theory of everything this isn't my theory it's a synthesis that's emerging and um uh really the story has been there for quite some time and the cybernetics pioneers actually a lot of them were you could call them like cosmic teleologists a lot of them did see this continual increase in complexity of course there's nothing mystical about it or supernatural about it um it's a mechanistic process that doesn't change the fact that nature seems to have these built-in goals that emerge from the fundamental laws and constants the parameters the the fine tuning um but it's a completely natural progressive teleological evolutionary process and so i'll just end up, you know this is just finishing up it's along the same line so that's good uh, questions can come after this I, I know it's been quite a lot so i will just try to sum this up simply um so uh Two important principles from cybernetics. So these came from Ross Ashby, who also created the principle of self-organization, which was really the first time people took self-organization seriously. So we think of complexity science as being the science of self-organization, but it really goes back to cybernetics. Um, I think the term, I think Kant might have talked about it, but it was Ross Ashby who tried to, you know, give it a make it a, a principle and a formalized concept. So there are these two concepts that really, I think, anybody interested in like Carl Friston's Bayesian brain hypothesis free energy principle should be aware of, because all of the way he talks about like, evolution comes from this Ashby's work, um, the good regulator theorem. <clears throat> it was also updated, there, there was the internal model principle, which came like a decade later, good regulator theorem came these, both these laws, I, th I think, came in the 50s, in the 40s or 50s, and then I think in the 70s, the internal model principle was created. But it basically says that any system that regulates or controls another system must have a model of that system. Otherwise, it can't regulate it. So it seems pretty obvious, but this talk of models kind of starts here that, that is very familiar to like anyone interested in like the free energy principle. So this this can be applied to inanimate systems. I mean, controllers are like house, like thermostats and stuff, but Ashby was really interested in adaptive systems. So he was thinking about evolution. So applied to evolution, an organism must model its environment uh, if it's going to extract free energy. Uh, and an organism is a model of its niche, like a key is a model of the lock it opens. So when we talk about these models, it can be kind of extract, kind of abstract, but I think this model, a key is a model of the lock it opens, really explains how an organism fits into a niche. Uh, you could also say like a hand fits into a glove, but it really, uh, the organism is a model of its environment. So natural selection is essentially an information channel that through evolution is pumping in information from the external world from the environment into the organism such that the organism is encoding the structure of reality encoding the structure of the world and its design uh include uh uh encodes information about the outside world so it's kind of a, a new way to think about evolution as this process of basically the universe is modeling itself and waking up through this process. It's pretty interesting, um, kind of psychedelic. <laughs> so um, the law of requisite variety is just telling you about the sophistication of that model. So how complex does the model have to be for the organism to stay far from equilibrium? Um, Ross Ashby's law says, <coughs> so John Naughton, researcher at Cambridge uh, kind of summed it up this way. In colloquial terms, Ashby's laws come to be understood as a simple proposition. 
If a system is to be able to deal successfully with the diversity of challenges that its environment produces, then it needs to have a repertoire of responses, which is at least as nuanced as the problems thrown up by the environment. So a viable system is one that can handle the variability of its environment, or as Ashby put it, only variety can absorb variety. So it's what we said before with evolutionary epistemology, an organism evolves to become as complex as its environmental niche requires. It has to specifically have enough behavioral responses which map onto internal states. So it has to have enough cognitive states to uh, respond to the number of challenges that the environment presents, challenges um, uh, in its ability to extract energy. And when, when you get organisms and you get, other, uh, you get other agents, other organisms, then of course, what the organism has to model is much more complicated because it doesn't have to just model the energy source in its environment, like to get food, it also has to model other modelers, other cognitive agents. Um, so yeah, basically any adaptive system has a, uh, 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 a behavioral repertoire and a repertoire of accessible mental states or for things without brains, computational states. And the number of states that the organism can access uh, should match the number of challenges, the number of states that could surprise the organism by the environment. Um, so a cat must have at least as many states as the ways the mouse can evade it, and the mouse has to have enough behavioral states to get away. So they model each other. A swordsman, like a fencer, must have many blocks as his opponent has attacks. And as we said, because behavioral responses map onto unique internal states, the loss of an organism must have as many accessible states as required by the complexity of the niche. So we already said this, uh, organism is some simplest solution to the thermodynamic problem of staying far from equilibrium. So a well-adapted species represents a biological solution to an existential thermodynamic lit dilemma. It's a sort of living, evolving scientific theory about how to most efficiently extract the free energy, the lifeblood of existence out of a particular niche. Some niches present a changing variety of challenges that must be adapted to while others present hardly any at all. So almost done here. I know it's a lot. Um, hopefully this can kind of wrap up the ideas and kind of show how they're all connected. Um, but this is still on this question of how complex is the universe uh, how complex can it get? So uh, Olivia, Jud Olivia Judson wrote this, uh, uh, published this paper called The Energy Expansions of Evolution. It's really nice. People should check it out. Uh, so she says, the history of the Earth life Earth system can be divided into five energetic epochs, each featuring the evolution of life forms that can exploit a new source of energy. These sources are geochemical energy, sunlight, oxygen, flesh, and fire. The first two are present at the start, but oxygen, flesh, and fire are all consequences of evolutionary events. And then she makes this statement. By the way, red is quotes if people haven't uh, figured that out. So these are her words. I forgot to put quote marks. Um, so no category of energy source has disappeared. This has over time resulted in an expanding realm of the sources of energy available to living organisms and a con commitment uh, increase in the diversity and complexity of ecosystems. So here's the way to think about it. Um, so taking the thermodynamic perspective and looking at organisms as energy flow channels, uh, we can think of each niche on earth as a sort of energy slot for a given species and an evolving population of organisms efficiently searching the solution space will eventually just by chance discover a solution to a thermodynamic problem that it didn't know existed. The discovery of a novel energy source or energy extraction technique is both how a new niche and a new species come into existence. So phylogenetic learning, which we saw in that chart, will naturally lead to speciation because organisms will stumble upon new ways to exploit thermodynamic niches that were previously inaccessible to life 
purely for design reasons. We're going to give examples on the next slide. Um, so as the biosphere accumulates knowledge through phylogenetic learning, not only is the solution space corresponding to one kind of thermodynamic problem being explored, there's a growing problem space, each with its own unique solution space. Um, so in an evolution, so there's an evolutionary trajectory that's not determined in the strict sense uh, envisioned by Laplace, where like there's no freedom and the future is like set in stone, but there is a sort of uh, statistical determinism, what I've been calling a non-equilibrium statistical determinism that guarantees that basically the inevitability of this emergence of a distribution of far from equilibrium attractors of varying, varying degrees of complexity. So each species can be seen as a, an attractor that's exploiting this niche. And you get this, uh, basically this diversity where you have uh, organisms uh, exploiting like the, the energy niches that were kind of the easy ones to exploit on earth, like the geochemical free energy we mentioned with the origin of life. And then sunlight was a, little bit of a more difficult challenge to uh, extract sunlight. It took some time for evolution to be able to do that. Um, so uh, extracting energy from the hydrothermal vents uh, source of energy is really simple because the energy is already like flowing through the system. It doesn't have to do much work. To extract sunlight, you have you know a moving sun. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated but not nearly as complicated as organisms that eat other organisms. So heterotrophic organisms, um, because they will have to model, not just like a sun moving predictably through the air, but have to model all these other agents, many of which are trying to eat them to kill you. Um, so basically, so answering this question, why increasingly intelligent species emerge? We started off with reductive autotrophs, those organisms around hydrothermal vents. They were a solution to the problem of how to extract free energy from geochemical gradients. Um, photosynthetic bacteria, the ancestors of plants were the solution to extract of how to extract all the solar energy that was flowing through the planetary system. So that was a big discovery made by life is that you, know, you can get energy directly from sunlight. Heterotrophic organisms, organisms that eat other organisms were the solution to the problem of how to extract energy from life itself. Once life starts having to model life, other agents with causal power and adaptive behavior, the computational task of extracting free energy gets increasingly difficult as increasingly complex species arise. So by virtue of having to model each other, the complexity of some species gets ratcheted up by what's known as an evolutionary arms race. So, the lion is evolving, you know, lions are producing offspring. Some of those lions will be better at predicting the gazelle's movements. The gazelle will also be creating offspring and some of those will be better at predicting the lion's attack. The ones that are better at predicting are the ones that get to uh, stick around. So you see how you have this ratcheting mechanism that ratchets up, ratchets up complexity. Um, there's actually a principle called um, the Red Queen principle uh, that says that for uh, an organism to simply stay in the game of existence, certain organisms, a certain species, they will have to become increasingly complex. And that comes from uh, Alice in Wonderland. Basically, uh, there's a scene with the Red Queen and Alice is, they're, they're all running as fast as they can. And Alice is like, you know, I'm running fast as I, I'm, I keep running, but I'm, I'm going nowhere. Like, so they're, they're all running, but they're, they're not making any distance. They're staying in place. And the Queen says something like, oh, you see here for that, uh, to go somewhere, you'll have to run much faster than that. Um, so the idea is that for a species that has to deal with this complex environment just to stay where it is just to stay in the game of existence it has to become increasingly complex it has to keep adapting so one thing that i wanted to get into more but i'm not going to is this idea of empowerment it comes from the computational neuroscience literature 
it's similar. It comes from Daniel Polani, but it's very similar to Harvard's uh, Alex Wisner, Wisner Gross. He has an idea called causal entropic forcing, but basically these people are arguing that, um, well, Wisner Gross is arguing that a causal entropic force uh, means that like basically with like evolution, you'll get a system, systems that uh, are trying to maximize the number of states they can respond to. So the maximize and the number of states they can respond to is mirrored by their internal diversity. So systems naturally try to increase the number of states. And it's this ability that allows for intelligence because if you have more states, going back to this law of requisite variety, you can respond to more challenges. So not every species is increasing empowerment, but you will get the emergence of increasing uh, increasingly complex uh, species because uh, each species uh, serves as food for a potential new species, um, you will get increasingly complex species that emerge over time and they will be increasingly empowered, meaning that they can respond to more environmental states and that they have more accessible mental or cognitive states. Um, I explained some of this in the last slide, but I'll just explain a little more. So open-ended niche emergence, why has the evolutionary record shown a trend of the emergence of increasingly complex forms? Um, because when all conceivable niches on earth were filled, that wasn't the end. New species created new niches because the free energy slot they provide is themselves, their food. So cybernetics guy, he's kind of like the last living cyberneticist uh, kind of, um, I'm sure there are other people that call themselves that, but he's kind of kept that title even when it like wasn't trendy. Um, he says it is well documented by evolutionary biologists that ecosystems tend to become more complex. The number of different species increases and the number of dependencies and other linkage, linkages between species increases. He cites E.O. Wilson, who recently passed away, um, who did a lot of work that, that kind of inspired a lot of the concepts in the book, um, not just this niche emergence, but also talking about super organisms, so collectives like ant colonies, self-organizing systems at all scales. But he said, not only do ecosystems contain typically lots of niches that will eventually be filled by new species, but there is a self-reinforcing tendency to create new niches. What does that mean? It means uh, the biosphere, uh, certainly ecosystems are themselves autocatalytic sets. So Seth Lloyd, he's talking about these chemical autocatalytic sets, but it's, I should have had this on the earlier slide, but it'll be a good way to kind of show the equivalence between ecosystems. Seth Lloyd says autocatalytic sets of reactions are powerful systems. In addition to computing, they can produce a wide variety of chemical outputs. In effect, an autocatalytic set of reactions is like a tiny computer controlled factory for producing chemicals. Some of these chemicals are the constituents of life. Now, Stuart Kaufman, big, you know, one of the main names who's kind of this whole talk, he's kind of put these ideas out there uh, since like the early nineties. Well, actually going back farther than that, but he started writing books in the nineties and really gaining exposure for the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, he's written a recent paper, well, semi-recent, um, about uh, niche emergence as an autocatalytic process. So ecosystems are autocatalytic, autocatalytically closed, self-sustaining reaction networks. So they're autopoietic agents that reliably drive up biological diversity and complexity as they self-amplify and evolve. So when you think about it, really all integrated networks of adaptive systems function as autocatalytic sets. There's been a lot of papers showing this, economies in a sense are autocatalytic sets, including the social organisms we call societies or civilizations. Um, so these networks are common because they emerge spontaneously when many organisms repeatedly interact with one another and discover synergistic collective configurations as nature often pressures them to do. So we're at the end, um, almost. Uh, we've explained why complexity increases. 
Uh, evolution will not increase the complexity of every species. They will become adapted to their niche. They will match the complexity of the niche. However, because new niches are always emerging, because species act as food for a, a potential new species, um, because of that process, you will get this increase. Uh, you will get species that emerge that have a higher number of uh, a larger repertoire of mental and behavioral states. So the law of requisite variety really explains why more complex environments create more complex niches. And this is open-ended. There's really no uh, limit to how far this process can go, especially since humans who are the pinnacle of this process, we're not you know, a lot of people have been against these kinds of views because it seems like it's saying that humans are superior. We're superior maybe computationally, but not superior in any other sense. We're actually part of the biosphere, which is this integrated, interconnected system. So it's really, you know, it doesn't make sense to think of us as like superior to nature because the whole biosphere is an organism that we're just sort of a, an organ for. Uh, we're basically the nervous system of the planet, the cybernetic uh, global system that people have called Gaia. Some people don't like that name. I think it's a perfectly good name. But um, that's why uh, complexity gets ratcheted up. But the final, um, uh, I guess, uh, part of, of this complexity increased story is that not only do you get increasingly complex species, uh, those species will interact naturally to form higher level uh, adaptive systems, which are co collectives. So um, I call this the principle of recursive self-organization based on Ashby's principle of self-organization. What I'm arguing is that when you have a biosphere with these agents and you have some are simple and some are complex, naturally those agents will interact. When they interact, they will uh, in many cases discover synergistic collective configurations. So configurations that make it easier for each agent to extract the energy they need to stay far from equilibrium. So why do interacting agents link up to form stable holes? For the exact same reason that molecules with the right chemical diversity will form stable autocatalytic reaction sets when pushed by a flow of energy. Working collectively allows the whole system to extract more free energy with less work. We can, that's the whole point of synergy is that working together makes your workload easier because there's a distribution of labor. And it's, it's really nice um, that, you know, this uh, distribution of species with some simple and some complex, uh, that's really what you need to create this like uh, cybernetic adaptive system at the level of a planet because a system uh, needs diversity among its components in structure and function for there to be this distribution of labor, labor which makes it this uh, collective whole, this, this synergistic uh, holistic unit. Um, so it's actually good that evolution and adaptation isn't increasing this, the complexity of each species like each species isn't becoming intelligent, like roaches aren't becoming like more and more intelligent over time with no limit. Um, the biosphere wouldn't be stable if that were the case. Uh, it's really uh, ecosystems need this diversity among components, just as a car with made of all engines isn't gonna be functional or, or an organism made of all brains. You need a variety of parts, some simple, some complex because they all do different functions. Um, so nature promotes cooperation, collaboration, and synergy because it is thermodynamically beneficial for all parties. Um, synergistic collective configurations will eventually be discovered by many component systems that are exploring various states or configurations through the blind variation and selective retention mechanism mentioned. Organisms only compete until they finally figure out what that working together makes everyone's task easier. And that goes for humans too. So it's kind of a moral lesson for everybody. The nations have to work together. We shouldn't um, get rid of the nations. There shouldn't just be this evolution into this like global government because the nations are actually uh, provide this diversity that we're saying is important. 
uh, because you need this uh, diversity of component parts to create a division of labor. So there's strength and diversity. This is different than the evolutionary picture of survival of the fittest, whereas there's just like this idea that the strong or the most intelligent survive. This is saying that that's not true. It's the most adaptive that survive, has nothing to do with strength or intelligence. Sloths have been around for many millions of years, despite being sloths, being slow, uh, because they exploit a source of free energy that's not being exploited by another uh, species. So um, going back to this kind of global message, you want nations to retain their identities, but you also want them at the same time to come together and to uh, work synergistically. So you basically want something like a global system, but this there has to be the optimal balance between centralization and decentralization. Um, neither approach will be good on its own. There needs to be this balance. So um, as long as the biosphere is creating a growing variety of complex adaptive systems, some of those will interact to produce higher level complex adaptive systems, which will come together to form even larger ones. This process continues uh, at higher scales. So I didn't go into this, uh, left out a kind of a neat picture that shows a brain and then the planet and it's like information networks. But uh, I do, th I, I hope that, you know, talk about Gaia and global brain will become, uh, will be taken as seriously as it should be. Uh, they really only weren't taken seriously because there were mystical notions associated with this word Gaia, which wasn't even James uh, Lovelock's uh, fault. He act the name guy came from his neighbor who is actually the author of Lord of the Flies, William Golding. So blame him for the, for the flowery metaphor with Gaia. Um, but yeah, the, the, the biosphere is a cybernetic organism and we are forming something like the global brain and a self-replicating biosphere uh, is essentially the next step. And when we are trying to terraform planets like Mars, that can be seen as the biosphere replicating. Uh, for humans to, at this point in our stage of development, we would have to kind of convert Mars to like a, something like a biosphere to have like oxygen. And so you can see how it's replication with variation. You get the same sort of thing, but because it's a different planet, there's going to be uh, variation. It's not going to be exactly the same, but that's how the evolutionary process continues. I should have showed this earlier. This is just showing how like eukaryotic single-celled organisms like amoebas will come together to form communities like a slime mold. Uh, these uh, multicellular organisms come together to form colonies. You see this ant colony. Ants actually really do form a super organism. You can see here, they actually build a bridge out of their bodies so that some ants can like climb across that bridge. So it really makes sense to call it a super organism or uh, at least like a, a super adaptive system or like a meta meta system um, because without it, we can't make sense of this collective behavior that's functional. Um, of course, human civilization, we again see this hierarchy. Now it makes more sense. Uh, we see that these evolutionary transitions, oh yeah, these are called evolutionary transitions. Sometimes I use the name metasystem transition because um, if we were talking about the brain, I would also talk about like uh, the emergence of a prefrontal cortex, which is like a high level controller. Um, that's also like a metasystem transition. So metasystem transitions are a little extend this where it's not talking necessarily about evolutionary transitions, but these other transitions where systems start to model themselves. Um, so here we see uh, how evolution has created these different memory uh, systems, these knowledge repositories. So it's that process of recursive self-organization that creates new memory systems. When you get go from single cell life to multicellular life to life with brains, uh, it's uh, these are in uh, revolutions in information storage machinery. So you can see how the information in the biosphere gets accumulated through an evolutionary process. 
Um, these are the final points. Yeah, so knowledge is power. It's not just the hollow buzz phrase of the digital age. It's true in the most fundamental way. Uncertainty reducing information is life's first and last weapon in an ongoing war with disorder. Without knowledge, life cannot exist for more than a moment, much less colonize the galaxy and beyond. This suggests that setting out on the path toward cosmic superiority is not a choice that intelligent agents like Homo sapiens make upon careful reflection, nor is it just some quirky ambition we stumbled onto by chance. This is the main point humanity's collective desire to transcend mortality and expand outward into space, so apparent from our current scientific and technological endeavors, SpaceX, uh, this doesn't emerge as an accident. This is an inevitable consequence of the fact that continual knowledge acquisition is a fundamental biological imperative. If life wants to persist and stay far from equilibrium, at some point it has to get off the planet because the sun is uh, going to die. And uh, it's these sorts of problems, these existential problems, which uh, create progress because it's our awareness of this problem which uh, forces us to uh, search the configuration space for the solutions that solve the problem. So as natural selection pumps information from the inanimate world into life, nature begins modeling itself and coding its own structure and the universe begins to wake up. We are the cosmos come alive, not metaphorically, but literally. This is Ray Kurzweil's uh, image from his book, The Singularity is Near. You can see that he sees this, he calls this the, the, the destiny of, of life in the universe. And he's not shy about using that word. Um, again, it's not determined in the strict sense of Laplace. This is uh, kind of a statistical determinism that creates these uh, series of attractors. And um, you've seen famous people, uh, so, you know, some people will see that idea and they'll have been reading Brian Greene and listening to all these reductionists and think that's not a scientific view. Well, uh, that's not true. And um, I hope to see more of these people speaking out about it. So Christoph Koch in Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist says, the rise of sentient life within time's wide circuit was inevitable. Teilhard de Chardin, who really came up with this, don't have time to talk about him, French philosopher and Jesuit, you should look into is correct in his view that the islands within the universe, if not the whole cosmos, are evolving toward ever greater complexity and self-knowledge. To be clear, he's not saying that Earth had to bear life, that you know, primates had to walk the African glasslands, but he says, I do believe that the laws of physics overwhelmingly favored the emergence of consciousness. The universe is a work in progress. Such a belief evokes Jer Jeremy, I don't know how to say that word, from many biologists and philosophers, but the evidence from cosmology, biology, and history is compelling. So there's some uh, advanced blurbs for this book. Uh, if you want to pre-order it, um, it comes out in June, uh, but every uh, order that I get from now until then will count towards my first week sales total. So that will help me get on bestsellers list. If you want to pre-order it now and you email me, um, I will send you a copy soon of this novel I also wrote called Road to Omega. I was pretty busy in the last five years. <laughs> yeah, I went into a cave for like four or five years, but this uh, is a vehicle for the science and philosophy in the book, kind of like an anti-Ayn Rand at the shrugged, maybe the opposite philosophy. Um, and the Road to Omega substack kind of turns this philosophy into kind of an effort to... Um, save the world with uh, science, epistemology, and blockchain technology. Uh, blockchains are part of this self-organization process. And that's the longest talk I've ever given. That's the longest I ever talked at one time, probably. My wife will probably say <laughs> that's not true, but uh, I'm tired, so let's uh, open it up to questions. And thank you for your immense patience. It's awesome to hear and think about it. So there are two questions in the chat. First is from Dean. Dean asks, how would we explain caring through a lens of free will or no free will? Would free will deniers say there is no caring when it appears that agents can or do fully care? Yeah, so great question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much to say without saying the things that I was going to bring up in the next talk, really explaining what free will is. I guess I should just say right now, 
uh, kind of a brief explanation of what I mean by free will. So I've, I hope I've made the argument that agency emerges uh, in adaptive systems that start off as biological organisms. And um, to the person, the self-driving car thing, I, uh, uh, just to mention that real quick, I don't think they're agents, but I do think uh, it's possible to create systems with agency um, for reasons that I ha haven't gone into. Um, uh, it seems important that the systems have a certain type of architecture. So not like uh, standard computer as a von Neumann architecture, and it's not uh, distributed or in integrated in the way the brain is. So it's not integrating much information. So these systems won't have causal power. They won't be agents. Um, so uh, neuromorphic hardware has been, uh, a lot of people think that's going to allow machines that can think and perhaps even be conscious. Um, I think maybe that's a way to go. Uh, it's probably a lot more complicated than that. That's a step in the right direction. So agency is real. It's uh, due to information, gain causal power in a system and starts, uh, it starts steering the system. So you'll see like a bacterium performing chemotaxis, but does it make sense to say that the bacterium has free will when it's going this way and that just because it's not predictable in the way an inanimate system is? So I would say that they have agency, but they don't have free will. What uh, free will is, and this is not my idea, other people have kind of been talking in this way. Kevin Mitchell uh, has a book, Neurogeneticist. Uh, he's coming out with a book called Agents, which is all about agency and free will. But um, the idea is that we are agents with causal power, but um, we're sort of, uh, we're, um, our responses like are basically uh, programmed responses uh, that are responses that occur um, automatically uh, that are informed by this uh, information that's been built up through evolution and adaptive learning. So a lot of the time we go through the day and we're not really thinking about things like driving or like waking up and like, you know, going to the fridge. We're not putting conscious thought into that. So that wouldn't seem to be free will uh, to me. You're, you're kind of acting on autopilot. So what free will is, is uh, a higher level of control that emerges with something like a prefrontal cortex in a global workspace. Basically, free will allow uh, uh, a prefrontal cortex allows an agent to override its uh, instinctive and automatic behaviors. Um, and so free will is something that uh, that we have, but only if we're exercising this higher level of control. It's associated with cognitive control or executive control, effortful control. And basically, um, if you have a healthy functioning prefrontal cortex, uh, you're going to basically the conscious mind is monitoring, uh, consciousness is a monitor. Uh, so it's, it's monitoring uh, your uh, behaviors. And if it uh, detects that there's suboptimal behavior for whatever reason, like it's just automatic kind of instinctual, let's say someone says something that makes us angry, and we respond immediately with like pushing them or something. Uh, that's not a wise uh, move. And that may, be, may happen when we're fearful because of the amygdala response. And we just have this automatic behavior. Um, but uh, free will would be when uh, the conscious mind overrides that process. And uh, Libet, actually, the free will studies that everybody cites as saying that we don't have free will. He actually never said that. He said free will is in this veto power. Like maybe some of our voluntary movements occur without conscious thought, but it's our ability to override those movements uh, that is the source of free will. But there was more problems with that. Actually, um, the studies have, Coke did a study showing that uh, basically um, that free will, um, uh, readiness potential, which is like a spike in electrical activity that occurs before you do this voluntary movement, this movement you think is voluntary. And everyone thought that this meant that you're not really making a conscious decision, that you could see this 
spike in brain activity earlier than the person thought they made the voluntary, voluntary decision. But a new study has shown that that's only the case when we're making like arbitrary decisions. And when they had people making a decision about when, when to donate like a large amount of money to a charity, you actually saw this readiness potential disappear. And so it seems like deliberate thinking, which is still this like prefrontal cortex, and there's this distinction between access, access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness that I didn't go into that I would in the next talk that Adam Saffron and in Integrated World Modeling Theory really gets at. But the idea is that the prefrontal cortex does allow us to override automatic behaviors. And that is a sort of freedom that we have. And we also lose it. Uh, in cases of schizophrenia, you see impaired uh, prefrontal cortex activity and drug addicts, you see impaired activity um, in drug, drug addicts, you see uh, they do repetitive behavior, even when they know that it's uh, not beneficial to them, they will still engage in that. So they're kind of stuck in this loop or this unhealthy attractor. Um, with schizophrenia, there's patients that uh, report being pushed around by forces that are beyond their control. Uh, I think that's because when the prefrontal cortex is uh, basically deactivated, um, people lose this sense, this ability to override their automatic behaviors. And I think that's what those people are experiencing, this sort of loss of this higher level agency that we've called free will. Um, another interesting, just the final interesting thing to mention about that is uh, Cotard's syndrome, or Cotard's delusion, is this delusion where, where people think they're dead. They think they're um, like ghosts or just not alive. It's really weird. A lot of people die from starvation because they think they don't have to eat because they think they're already dead. Um, you actually see from neuroimaging studies, they've showed uh, like impaired activity in the prefrontal cortex. So maybe these people who think they're dead have lost this high level agency and, and they feel like they're ghosts or something. Um, as far as caring, uh, so um, caring is a part of like emerge through evolution because you do have this benefit to cooperating with each other, this self-organization process that we talked about that happens naturally because basically you find that when you work together, you minimize conflict and um, uh, align it, you align interests. And so caring, altruism, empathy, all of those things are as natural uh, and as Darwinian as anything else. But you have to add on to evolutionary theory all of this stuff about self-organization and cooperative evolution. Um, as far as he, say, he said something about why people uh, who uh, don't believe in free will, I, f I forget the exact point about the caring what was that um when when it appears that agents can or do fully care but sorry what was the what was the first part of it um how would you explain caring through a lens of free will or no free will would free will deniers say there is no caring when it appears that agents can or do fully care yeah no it's it it, it flies in the face of like uh our our everyday experience so like yeah, um, I th the <laughs> the the amount of contradictions and like logic that doesn't make sense when you go down that path of there being no free will or agency, um, you just you just get into absurd territory. It's I think when we look back, it's going to look quaint that for so long that we thought that everything was determined in this strict sense. And it's really a big issue because these people who believe that if they believe it, if they take it to heart they're experiencing cognitive dissonance at every moment, you know, and, and the people who argue against agency, they talk about religious people having to compartmentalize to deal with, you know, the, the real world. But anybody who believes that we don't have agency has to compartmentalize in the same way. Uh, funny little conversation between Sam Harris and his uh, wife, um, uh, Annika Harris, uh, who wrote a book, called Conscious, that is a great accessible book, but it leaves out like everything that I've discussed uh, and that I would discuss about like the Bayesian brain hypothesis, uh, global workspace theory, it doesn't really go into integrated information theory in any depth. So like all of 
the things that they're missing that do explain a lot of this stuff uh, can be found in like modern neuroscience. So we are making a lot of progress towards, you know, understanding the hard problem of consciousness, so subjective experience, but also like free will and agency. But it's funny because they're having this conversation in the podcast and they're discussing whether since a belief in no free will, as mentioned, that New York Times article, I think 2011, showed that they have less moral behavior and it can, you know, cause depression. They're discussing whether they should tell their daughter about free will or not, that, that she doesn't have any free will. The discussion is like, should we tell our daughter that she doesn't have free will? But the actual discussion uh, implies that they believe that they have some choice whether to tell her or not. They're having a discussion about whether they should do this or not. So there's a contradiction in their conversation that contradicts what they believe. What's interesting is that if they do tell her that she has no free will and she believes it, she's actually going to have negative mental effects. Like it will Har you know, be harmful, um, assuming that she really believes it. I don't know if it has that in, in everyone, but you do see studies that show that. Um, so if we do have free will, it's a very bad thing to be telling people. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is, well, it's, it's interesting because if she's familiar with epistemology and they tell her that she doesn't have free will, but she goes, okay, that's based on a model that has uncertainty and that model may be disproved, then she might not have the negative effects of free will. So I think everyone should practice being a good Bayesian and understand that our models, our theories, even the one that I just talked about, um, will have errors and will be shown to be wrong. And if reductionists do that, they won't call free will, belief in free will, like comparing them to horoscopes, which is just, I think, a horrible statement. And kind of funny that physicists don't like it when like neuroscientists start and biologists start like talking about physics. It's kind of strange that physicists are, are so sure that we don't have free will when they're not familiar at all with the neuroscience behind agency and free will. So would you like me to just read a comment in the chat? Otherwise I think we can kind of come to a close. Um, if there's anything, yeah, I can do one more question. Yeah, well, uh, Marco and Dave and others, thanks a lot for the great comments and commentary in the chat. I hope that, Bobby, I hope you check the um, live chat replay. Um, and uh, Sean O'Connor wrote, thanks for the good and informative talk. Dr. Azarian mentioned the idea of evolutionary arms race. I was hoping to recommend that he consider, if he hasn't, how an intraspecific evolutionary arms race may relate. Uh, I'm not familiar with the intrust specific. So uh, perhaps like you... a game theory, Red Queen, not between uh, two species, but within one species. Yes. So you would have an evolutionary arms race there too. Yeah, certainly. Because you're competing with other organisms. Um, and uh uh, John Maynard Smith, who I mentioned earlier, uh, talking about like this causal power of information in biology, he uh, was the person to bring von Neumann's game theory to biological evolution. So he did all, he basically showed that there is this, you know, game theory sort of process being played out. I think he, his examples use different species, but I think within species, um, you would see the sorts, same sort of thing. Of course, if it's not humans, you know, if you have other species, people are competing, organisms are competing, you will get increased complexity, but there are limits. So just because there's these evolutionary arm races uh, within and between species, there will still be a limit because uh, they have to model the environment and just modeling all these unnecessary variables uh, is, is wasteful. So um it will ratchet up complexity in species but um i think at least with the planet earth and our biosphere that uh that humans are this sort of leading envelope uh of complexity and um so it really just is open ended with the most complex species so the most complex species is the one that will evolve toward higher complexity 
And uh, really, there might be a limit. There, there are reasons to think there are limits to how far human biological intelligence can emerge. There's, I mean, can evolve towards, there's something called a cephalization limit, which is like how big our brain can get because of reasons like having to do with like the skull. And um, so, but what's interesting is part of this process, this evolutionary process is, as Popper and newer people like Dennett have mentioned, continues with science and culture and technology. So humans really have open-ended complexity because we're, uh, we're augmenting ourselves with technology. So while biology, biological complexity may have limits, there's no limits once we start merging with our technology. And we shouldn't see technology as separate from life. Uh, it's an extension of biology. So the extended phenotype, Richard Dawkins explains like beaver dams, considers like the, the dam that the beaver instinctually builds as part of the whole phenotype. So the ecosystem, the organism, there's really no clear division between the organism and the ecosystem. And David Chalmers has the extended mind hypothesis, which says that our phones are extensions of our minds and um, all of our devices are. And for that reason, we need to be worried about privacy, but we also need to not be scared of technology. We just need to use technology to become more human. So we're not transcending like humanity and biology. Uh, technology will allow us to become hyper biological. Very interesting note, perhaps to close it on. Anytime you want the dot to. We can make it happen. It can be any format. We can invite anyone else on. Um, really awesome and interesting to think about. Do you want any last words? Um, if if I come back to talk about free will and agency, it'd be great to have like Kevin Mitchell or um, maybe Eric Coyle, who's done a lot of work on uh, top-down causation and causal emergence that was really influenced, uh, influential on the book. Um, if, thank if you know yeah. people, you can... Um, Twitter, sure. tag them or email us and uh, email them and CC us or just contact us and we'll do that on our side. Thanks. It's been super fun. Thanks, Daniel. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate you reading a draft of the manuscript just like in a few days to give me some feedback that actually helps clear up little mistakes in the book. Um, I heard you mention Marco. Thanks uh, to Marco and anybody else who's uh, been watching and chiming in with questions. Really appreciate it. Sorry for the information overload. Maybe watch this again. Maybe microdose. <laughs> or um, maybe some legal stuff. Delta 8 or, or water. weed for people. Microdose for people, water. Stay hydrated. For people where it's legal. Keep Stay those, hydrated. Keep